share, I'll go ahead and share my screen. So we have, um, so I apologize. Um, things have got a bit crazy between Passover and my, uh, I, I, I have a family member having a medical emergency and I've been busy trying to get things sorted out here so that my wife can possibly go down to Georgia to make sure that her brother is okay. He's currently in the hospital and the prognosis is, well, if he can walk, if he can walk again, he'll have to do so with a lot of difficulty. So it's been a bit of a trying time. Uh, so sorry about basically being late with stuff. Um, and for doing this over Zoom, it's just, this is the only way that was really feasible for, for things to get done reasonably. Um, so, anyway, what we're going to be doing today is we are going to, I was gonna start um, going over your, um, sorry, reviewing for the final exam. Um, now I can review the same stuff that I did for the morning, or I can do new stuff, or I could, and then do the stuff they did yesterday. I'll probably just go with the same stuff. That way it's consistent. No problems there. All right. So I, I haven't written. Well, I mean, we're going to go up. I mean, if I didn't cover the same stuff today, I'd be covering it tomorrow right if i did if i it was either doing a and a and then b and b or a b b a so it's a matter of it doesn't really make sense so let's go ahead and first off where are we going to find it so first off i will send out information tonight about the final exam i have to send it out to the other professors first um um and then of course, if so, assignments are all due on the 25th. If you cannot, if you don't, if you can't demo them by the 25th, that's okay. Just we'll schedule some time to demo them together. Uh, and also, when after I send out the final exam information, because the final exam won't be taking place in our normal room, it will be in a different room because it's a common final. If you can't make it to the final, sorry, if like there's a conflict for your final exam, please let me know. I'll be happy to rearrange uh, stuff so that you can take it uh, proctored as need be. It's gonna be the same kind, my goal is to have the same kind of permissions as the, regu as the regular exam. Uh, that's about it. Um, and now what I'm going to, so, okay. Oh, right. And it will have a, if, if need be, because your laptop, because, you know, uh, it may not be possible for you to plug into your laptop to a source and Murphy's Law. Uh, if you need a paper exam for some reason, I will provide you with paper. So no worries there. Okay. So I don't, I have a study guide kind of thing study like kind of list. So go to, so if I click on the GitHub link, go to uh, destruct, here's all my code that I, that that's for the data structures I've done. And then there's this study guide, guide.pdf. It's just a list, list of topics that you might want to, that, that you should, uh, you know, make sure you know. Um, sorting, I'm especially interested in insertion sort, quick sort and part, uh, quick sort and how it's done in place using the partition function, merge sort, Huffman encoding, lists. You don't need to, so you don't need to know how to implement the data structures, but you do need to know how to uh, write them. Sorry, write code that uses them. So know how to use your array lists and linked lists, know how to use your stacks and queues, know how to eat about your trees, your heaps, and hash tables and collisions, and we'll go over that today, as well as graphs and their various representations, which we'll also go over today. So I had some links to, to final exams. Some of them are dead, uh, like this Harvard final, they moved it, but that's not too hard because I just searched for uh, 
Harvard uh, practice final. I believe this was the one I was going over. Yep. No, nope, this is a different one with different, does it have different questions? Yeah, it has some different questions. Some of them are better. Okay. Yeah, I'll probably go over that one. Harvard data structures. Final exam. And basically I'm gonna look at other universities final exams and go over them. Uh, yeah, it's the same one. There we go. All right, so let's go over them. And I've got a Wacom tablet here, so that so be patient with me on that. All right, suppose that item that items A, B, C, D are pushed into that order on an initially empty stack S. Okay, I will do so. A, B, C, D, E. S is then popped off four times. And as each item is popped off, it is inserted into an initially empty queue. Okay, so E gets popped off, it gets put on in queued here, right? Because this is last in, first out. D, we pop this four times, so C and B. Yeah, B. If two items are then removed from the queue, what is the next item that will be removed from the queue? So we always remove two the two, we always remove items from the front. So we remove the first two items. So next item to be removed from the queue is C. All right. If the binary tree below is printed in pre-order traversal, what will the results be? So pre-order means to do to handle my to print myself first. If I'm printing, if I am doing, if I am printing pre in pre-order, that means I am printing the root, and then I'm printing my left subtree in pre-order, then I'm printing my right subtree in pre-order. Okay, so that means that the root root has to be handled first, which means that these two things don't work. So anyway, pre-order means that it's going to be. We're going to do six first, and then six left subtree before we go on to six right subtree. So going on to the left subtree over here, we want to do a pre-order of the left subtree. That means doing 17 next, and then we do a pre-order of 17's left subtree, and it's right subtree. So the left subtree is just nine, and then the right subtree is four. So now, we're done with this, with this over here. And then we do 22, 16, and then 12. 20, the right subtree is 22. And then we do the right subtree's left, and the right subtree's right. And we see that basically that the first four numbers do give us a proper answer. Um, this one is wrong because it's, this one is doing 6, 17, 22, 9, 4, 16, 12, 12, which is, so going across like this is level order traversal. And then I don't know what was going on here with 6, with C, 6, 17, 6, 17, 4, 17, 4, 16, 22. I don't even know at that point. I don't know what C is. And then nine would have been uh, nine, 17, nine, 17, six, four. I don't, again, I don't know what's going on there. And then finally the A, nine, four, 17, 16, 12, I think they meant to put 22 there, but they were going for post order there. All right, now this one, next one is I want to find very, very good. 
this is a great question because it illustrates something. A graph implementation that uses a 2D array to represent edges would be most reasonable in, the in which of the following cases. A graph with 1,000 nodes, 1,200 edges, 100 nodes, 40 edges, um, 1,000 nodes, 10,000 edges, 10 nodes, 20 edges, none of these. All right, so I do two recordings, but I'll probably just upload this one because this one, I have the benefit of hindsight when I'm doing these the second time around. So this time I'm actually gonna draw a graph because I think that'll be more illustrative. Right, so A, B, C, D, and I will make it directed, a directed graph. So we have A going to B, B going to A, C, D, and then uh, C also goes to itself. Okay. And D will go to C. All right, so there's a couple ways to represent this graph. The first way is an adjacency list. So E is just plain wrong because we can use an, a link structure. Uh, specifically, we'd be using a map with a list on the end, typically a linked list. So what we would do is basically the key is the node and the value. So key being the node, and then the value being all the edges that it is, all, all the edges that are connected. So A can go to B. B goes to A and C. C goes to D and C. And D goes to C. OK, order doesn't really matter in these things. But that's a, but basically here what we've got is a is tip, typically this list is a linked list. Whatever, I mean typically it's just a map key value kind of thing. So I guess technically comma 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 chameleon. Okay. So now what's the other way to represent this? So clear no I don't want to clear. I have a graph. I don't want to erase. The other way to represent it is the two D matrix. Satisfying to just scratch everything out. Okay, 2D matrix. How do we represent this as a 2D matrix? Well, we've got A, B, C, and D, and we've got A, B, C, and D. I'll do my best to draw straightish lines. Ah, you're terrible at this. This is why I don't have a PhD in art. Okay, so now what we do is that we're going to use a one to represent the presence of a node, uh, a node, and a zero, and and we'll leave it blank if it's not. Okay, so or sorry, one to represent the presence of an edge, and just leave it blank otherwise. Um, typically we put in a number like negative infinity, to say or something to say that it's not there if it's a weighted graph. So a to b, or sorry, positive infinity, a to b exists. B, so now this is the B's, B's connections are to A and to C. C's connections are to C and to D, and D has a connection also to C. So that is the matrix way of doing it. So which one do we use? Well, the lookup time on this is pretty darn good, but it, uh, and, and you can refer to the videos that I've done on this previously, but there's an issue. The issue is, is that basically it's all of these, you know, all of these blank spaces over here where we, we use space to represent the non-presence of an edge. Whereas basically we only, in, in the list notation, we only use it, you know, we only, we only use all the connections we have. See, plus the overhead of a linked list. A long story short, we want a, we want to we use this for we use this no, for sparse graphs. In other words, graphs that don't have a lot of edges, graphs where the number of 
edges. Sparse is where the number of edges is about equal to the number of vertices squared. Sorry, the number of vertices, not the number of vertices squared. And then dense graphs are used when the number of edges are approximately equal to, is on the same order of O of v, the number of vertices squared. Long story short, this is what we're looking for. There's a lot of complicated math that could go in there, but long story short, we're looking for a graph for, a, we wanna use, a graph is dense when 25% of all possible edges exist. And the number of possible edges is the number of, uh, is the number of vertices squared. So that's where we're looking for. So for example, is this a sparse or a dense graph? Well, we see that roughly the nodes are about, we've got about 20% more no edges and nodes. It's, or if we do it mathematically, we see that if we have, we have 1200 edges, okay? But that's out of a possible 1 million edges. Why? Because a thousand squared, that's the amount of possible edges that could exist in the symbol graph. So uh, that's 12 out of 10,000. And that looks like a really big number. Oh, sorry, very, very small number, very small percentage, less than 25%. What about 100 nodes? So this is a sparse graph. What about this one? 100 nodes, 4,000 edges? Well, 100 nodes, I mean, on average, that's about 40 edges per node. Specifically, what we're looking at is there's 10,000 possible edges. 4,000 of those edges exist. Remove the zeros, four out of 10. 40% of all possible edges exist in this. That's more than 25%. That's probably our answer. A thousand nodes, 10,000 edges. That gets us 10,000 out of a million. So four cross off four. That's 1% of all possible edges. And then over here, with some basic math, we see that there's 20% of the edges. So B is our answer because that is the graph that where we have the most pos where where basically that we can clearly say that is a dense graph. The nodes have lots of edges. All right, another great question uh, test you on traversals, and I, I really like this one. Uh, a binary tree is constructed of nodes that are instances of the following class. So they didn't use generics. We use generics um, because I find them important and I want to make sure you can use Java and not get any warnings from the compiler that are very annoying. So their nodes have a int value instead of a data, and then they have a left, right. Just so, so it's fairly straightforward. Vanishing pen, why does it vanish? Oh, that's cool. I didn't realize you even had that. Okay. So let's see how, if I can use that pretty well. Okay. So what we have, so consider this following method. It takes in a root. Okay, it takes in the root of a subtree or subtree. So first let's look at if root.write is equal to null, return root. So in other words, if root.write is null, in other words, if I don't have a right subtree, and that looks something like this, right? If I am here as a node and I have a left subtree, but not a right, I'm gonna return this. Otherwise, return mystery function root.write. So let's in our hypothetical, in any kind of hypothetical, in a hypothetical graph that I'm going to draw or a tree, right? I'm going to go ahead and draw just this big abstract tree. 
right? So mystery node, passing this root over here. If root.write is null, well, it's not null. I have this tree over here. If that's not null, if that's null, return myself. Well, it's not null, so I'm going to keep going root.write. So I'll call that on the node there, which will call mystery on the node over here, which will call mystery on the node over here, and so on and so forth, right? See, everybody see how it's recursive and constantly calling the next node, OK? The next node to the right. When it finally gets to the rightmost node, OK? When it finally gets the right to the rightmost node, the rightmost node will, will have nothing to the right of it, because it's the rightmost. And then it will return itself, which will return will return itself, which causes mystery.root.write from its caller to return. So it's going to get passed up all, all the chain. End result, this will return the rightmost node in the tree. Make sense? All right. Now, to show that we understand it, we, can, we, we uh, consult three supposedly tech-savvy consultants. And we get the following three opinions about what method is the method does. The, when we're past the reference to the root, uh, the, the root root node of a binary tree. Consultant one says it returns the last node visited in, in order traversal. Second person said, the consultant two says the last node visited by post order. And the third one says it visit, returns the last node visited by a level order traversal. Which of these opinions are correct regardless of the constant of the tree? Why do I keep touching this? Okay, control C. Okay. So let's look at consultant number one's opinion. Consultant number one says the last node visited in, in order traversal. Now, when we do an in order traversal, that means uh, handle the left subtree, then handle myself, then handle my right subtree. If we go to the right subtree, it's gonna say, hey, handle my left subtree, then myself, then my right subtree. So the rightmost, so, um, and if we do an in-order traversal, by the way, like of any kind of BST, we're gonna get the largest number as the last output, right? Makes sense, in-order traversal, we'll give it to you sorted in order. And the rightmost thing is always the biggest thing. So A is correct, or sorry, not A is correct, but one is correct. The last node visited by an inner tra in order traversal will always be the biggest thing, and our function returns the biggest thing. Consultant two, post order traversal. Post order says, do, uh, hey, left subtree, right subtree, then me. One, two, three. So the rightmost node, this is only going to be the work in this case, where we have this tree. Where I have no, where I don't have a right subtree, but I do have a left subtree. But it has to work for all trees. So uh, number two is just plain out wrong. Number three, the last node visited by a level order traverse, traversal. And this one could trick you a bit because if we draw ourselves a perfect tree, So level order means basically go in the order uh, of four if we were making this a complete tree. So in other words, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? Now in this case, the in order traversal would give us this one and level order traversal would go here, 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 aha. It would give us the same one in a perfect tree. However, if we remove that last node, Level or traversal will give me this one, but in order traversal will give me this one. And this one is the right is the rightmost node, which is the biggest node, which is what would be returned by mystery. So two is not correct either. So the only one correct is number one. All right. With a poorly chosen hash function, is it possible to have a situation 
sorry, it is possible to have a situation in which the search time for a hash table of n items goes to da 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 da. All right. So um, let me go ahead and write a bad hash function. H of x, where x is our key, is equal to 0. That means everything gets hashed to the same index, index 0. That means that if, that means when I put in my first item, I'm going to put it here. When I put in my second item, I'm going to try to put it here, but I can't, so I'm going to try to put it here. When I try to put in my third item, I try to put it here, but I can't. So I try to put it here, but I can't. So I put it here. When I put in my fourth item, I'm going to try to put it here, but I can't. Try to put it here, but I can't. Try to put it here, but I can't. But I'm going to find an empty spot here. Using, this is using uh, linear probing. right? And so trying to search something, insertion goes to O of n, and search time also would go to O of n, although the search time is easier to see if we were to use bucketing, because in which case, this would be the link the adding to a linked list, and we'd keep adding an item to a linked list. And then if we were to search this linked list for an item, well, we have one massive linked list and a bunch of wasted space. And the amount of time it takes to find something in a linked list of size n is O of n. So yeah, A is our answer, right? It's like the worst case scenario for a tree. You're not going to get quadratic time and, and log of n is what we're trying to beat. Okay, this was number six was on your first exam, so no need to go over it. Or on the practice exam, rather. Okay. So a police department wants to maintain a database of up to 1,800 license plate numbers of people who receive frequent tickets, so it can be quickly determined whether or not a given license plate number is in the database. Speed of response is very important. Efficient use of memory is also important, but not as important as the speed of response. Which of the following data structures would be most appropriate for this task? OK. So let's look at this. We have, um, OK. So what we're caring about here is speed and memory, but we care more about memory, sorry, speed than memory. So if we have a tie, we're going to break, we're going to use speed as the type, oh, sorry, memory as the tiebreaker. Okay, first one, sorted linked list. Sorted linked list, well, uh, linked list only has a, only had, right? And yeah, there's probably back references too, but that doesn't matter for the purpose of searching, right? We only have two, point, we have only two places to go to in, in a sorted linked list. The head or the tail are our starting point. And if we, and we have to start there and then to find something, and even in a sorted list, we'd have to iterate to that point. A sorted linked list would take O of n time, which not great. Also it had, would use O of n auxiliary extra space for all these pointers and stuff. Uh, all, all the references. All right, B, a sorted array with 1800 entries. Well, sorted array, this is actually as, as, as memory efficient as it gets. It takes constant time memory. So if we cared about memory, so yeah, if we were caring about uh, efficient use of memory, then that would be our number one choice. But we care more about the speed. OK, so but how long does it actually take? Well. With a sorted array, we could do binary search. We look at the middle uh, value, and we are and given our license plate number, we search the left half if it's less, and the greater half and the greater half if it's uh, more, cutting out half of our search space each time we check when we use this process recursively. Okay, so the overall for this one is O log of n for our runtime for b. Now for c, d, and e, you'd think, OK, they're all constant time, right? Hash tables use constant time, and they use O of n memory. But they all use it, but all these are using a different amount of memory, 1,800, 3,600, and 10,000. 
Okay. So what do we do? How do we figure out? Well, you might now C is the trap answer because you think, okay, 1800 license plate numbers and 1800 entries. That's the most memory efficient. But what we're gonna see is that the runtime is constant for CD and E, but the runtime for using a, a hash table with open addressing uses this for, uses a formula. I believe I present the formula in a slide, but let me go ahead and show it to you on a video. Let me go ahead and show it to you over here. So the expected runtime is equal for, so the expected runtime expected, oh, I see what happened there. So expected runtime of, of, a, of look up in a hash table, okay, is equal to one plus this equation. And I'm working off memory, so it should be correct, but there's a possibility that it's kind of not one plus one over one plus L over two. Now what in the world is L? L is essentially the number of items in here divided by the capacity, okay? But here's the trick for, for doing, for getting our constant time, okay? We can replace N uh, with basically the, a maximum value for N saying we aren't gonna let it fill up more than this or more specifically, there's a maximum value for L. There's a maximum value for L that we are going to allow. And so we could say that, um, so typically for hash tables, it's like saying like, hey, I'm not gonna let the load factor get more than 75% or it's gonna be, or the worst the load factor is gonna be 0.5. And remember, and the lower the load factor, the better. So by having a maximum, we can remove N from the equation, which means that it's no longer related to N, it's related to this load factor. The only thing is, is that when we have a maximum load factor, this means that basically that 50% of the memory is going to be wasted. Or in the case of this, 75% of the memory is going to be wasted. Okay, but what does this come down for he here? Um, so first off for this first equation, we notice, oh, I'm so sorry. I did a plus. It's not plus. the minus, there we go. Okay, yeah, so there's a load factor. I, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I wrote a plus, it's a minus. Okay, this is what happens when you write and talk at the same time. Okay, so, okay, we noticed that, um, that, so here what we're gonna notice is that basically our our load factor is essentially going to be 1800 divided by whatever this number is over here. So in this case, it would be 1800, 1800 divided by 1800 is one, one over one minus one is zero, which approaches infinity. So uh, instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna just make that a bit nicer for us. The most we're gonna put in it and, and, less, and less having to deal with the, the vastness of infinity. So let's go ahead and, and, and I'll alter this number. And I'm gonna do that plenty of times. So 1799, that's close enough. So 79, 1799 over 1800 is our load factor. One minus, so now let's go, I'll work, I'll do some work over here. One, and I'll do it in a different color so that we can, um, so, that, so that we can kind of deal with it. So one, nope, here, one over one minus 1799 over 1800 is equal to one over 1800, which just becomes 1800. 
So this entire equation becomes one plus 1800 over two, which means that on average, if we fill it up this one, the average lookup time is 1800, which is, well, that's O of n because that's how many entries we're going to put in. It's on the same order of magnitude. Right? And you can think about it with the car, par, car parking technology, right? Uh, or a parking lot. Big parking lot, but all the spaces are filled. It's going to take forever to find this empty space. So now let's do this for our second one. Okay, so 30, so here we're gonna do it. We have 1800 out of 3600. And the math here is nice. That's just one half. So our load factor is one half in this case. So our equation becomes one plus one over one plus one half, so minus minus one half all over two. This becomes one half. One over one over two becomes one half, which, and this becomes, sorry, not one half. One over one over two becomes two. Ugh. One plus two becomes three. Three divided by two is 1.5. So our final answer for this one is that is that the worst lookup time is 1.5. That's constant time. Okay. Now for the last one, I'm going to change the uh, the equation again, where instead of because we have 10,000 entries, but 18,000 is not as great of a number for for my math. So I'm just going to up this to 2,000. So that I can go and say that my load factor is going to be 2,000 over. And so this would be higher, a bit higher than normal, but that's fine, which means that this is 1 over 5. So now let's plug that into our equation. 1 plus 1 over 1 minus 1 fifth over 2. So this becomes 4 out of 5. That means that this equation, when you have a fraction under a 1, you just flip it. 5 over 4, 1 plus 5 over 4, that becomes 9 over 4. And then finally, 9 over 4 divided by 2. Dividing by 2 is the same thing as multiplying by 1 half. And that's easy to do. So it becomes 9 over 8, which is equal to 1.125 because I've seen that, not because I can do the math, but because I've seen that number enough on a fraction. <laughs> Sorry, on, on a calculator. Ah, yay pattern recognition. So 1.5 and 1.125, they are both basically constant time, but so which one should we use? We should use D because efficient use of memory is also important. That's our tiebreaker. This one is using a, this one's basically saying, hey, we'll just waste half the memory. And this one's saying, we're going to waste 80% of the memory to just get a marginal speed up of runtime. Um, yeah, this was a pretty big mess, but that's okay. It all goes away. So much easier to do than dry erase. It doesn't smell either. Okay. I, was that more detail than you'd probably need to know for the final exam? Yes, but I really like making sure I do my job as far as teaching you and making sure you understand this. And again, like distributed hat. So I just a bit about myself that that um, you probably don't know. I my research area when I did my PhD was on something called distributed hash tables. And part of my research was tearing out assumptions about the hash functions that were, you, that were used. You typically use cryptographic hash functions, which are great because they're secure. It, meaning that you, with a cryptographic ha hash function, um, that basically you're going, you're given a, you know, given your key, it transforms it into this, uh, into this hashed number. And with cryptographic hash functions, there's no, it's secure. 
there's no way to go from this, the hashed number, back to the key. You can't do it. There's just no way. That's what hash functions do or cryptographic hash functions do. And they also say, yeah, it's also statistically random. But what my research was showing was actually we, a lot of people assume DHTs are statistical, sorry, the people who used DHTs would assume it was statistically random. And I was going back to the original paper saying, no, these aren't statistically random and we can exploit that. So, so that may be why I'm slightly obsessed about these things because it was a good couple of years of my, of me as, of me doing paper reading. Okay. So an integer, an array of seven integers is being sorted by the heap sort algorithm. After the initial phase of the algorithm, constructing the heap, which of the uh, following is a possible ordering for the array? So remember heap sort, right, gives you an array and then it takes O of n, then we do something called heapify, which is an O of n process which transforms it into a max heap. Okay. And then we perform the sorting process on that to transform it into a sorted array. So this first part takes an array, trans takes an unsorted array, transforms it into a max heap. This part over here takes and like and this max heap to the sorted array. And the way that does, it works is that you take the first thing in the heap, which is the max value, and you move it to the end and then pretend it doesn't exist anymore. And then you re and you reshape the heap, which takes n log, uh, log n time. You do that n time to have the sorted thing. It's pretty elegant. It's pretty nice and nifty. But right over here, it's saying we take an array, we sort it into a max heap. We, we turn it into a max heap. Okay, after the initial phase of the algorithm, which is this, which is, um, in one second. So after the maximum part of the algorithm, which it, sorry, the initial phase of the algorithm, which is this phase over here, which of the following is a possible ordering for the array? So it's asking which of these is a max heap? So first off, D is not a max heap because with a max, now there's this formula that we can use, but, and, and you can go back to your lectures and find it, but I'm not going to use it here. We can just draw the heap. And with D, we can see 45, then 85, right? So this is the array. 45 is at index zero, 85 is at index one, index two is 78. But if we draw it out, we basically draw it out in level order, 53. 51, 49, 47. And if we see this, we see that basically while this subheap is a max heap and this subheap is a max heap, this actual whole heap is not a max heap because the, sm because the smallest item is at the top. And it's the one that's different than the others. Very, very different. So that means it's a trap. All right, so max heap. Max heap means that basically that Biggest item should be at the top, which is 85, but also the subheaps also need to be a max heap. So 78, 45, 51, 53, 47, and 49. And now I'd be like looking into each of your eyes if we were in class and like trying to like make, you know, make some kind of connection there to make sure that you were following, but uh, can't do that on Zoom. It's one of the downsides. But we see over here that this over here is, this sub heap over here is not a max heap, right? 85 is bigger than all of its children, but 45 over here is smaller than its children. That means that A is not a max heap. Next, 85. 49, 78, 45, 47. So, so good so far. And then 51 and 53. So this is a max heap. We can go through the others, but we would see that those are also not max heaps. Okay. This binary tree shown below was constructed by inserting a sequence of items into an empty tree. 
Which of the following input sequences will not produce this binary, uh, this binary search tree? All we have to do in this case is look for gaps. What do I mean by that? Once we find the answer, which will probably, which is the last one, if I recall, you'll see. So for instance, for the number one, we do five, three, four. So if we would insert five, then three would go to the left, then four would go to the right, then nine would go to the right of five, then 12 would go to the right of that, and then seven would go to the left of nine, then eight would go to, and so on and so forth. But the last one, I'll go ahead and skip to the end because I'd just be putting dots on everything otherwise. But with the last one, which is E, we insert five as the root, we insert nine, we insert three, but then we insert six. If we insert six over here, then we'd have to put it there. And then seven would go to the left of that. And that's not the way this looks. F number, the way the tree E looks is five, nine, three, six, seven, eight, four, 12, 20, which is a very different tree. This and this, even though they have the same values, no longer match structure-wise. So it's a different tree. Okay. Went over this kind of in class when I was talking about stuff. This is two, three trees. This is new. And it's and it's going to be, there's going to be an equivalent question on the final exam. So that's kind of a pointer to take value because we haven't had to, uh, something over hash tables like this. So get, you are given an initially empty hash table of size seven that uses open addressing. The following sequence of keys to be inserted is 15, 17, 8, 23, 3, 5. Inserting these keys, sorry, using the, each of the following approaches. If an overflow occurs, say so and indicate the element that causes the overflow. So I'm going to go ahead and mega zoom here because that way I can write in stuff. Mm, that's a bit too much. One cl more click out. There we go. Okay. So what we've got here is basically uh, we are doing linear pro uh, open addressing with linear probing. We're inserting these keys. We don't care about the values because the values don't dictate where these things go. So we're just given the keys. We want to see where they would end up in these arrays. Okay. So, and we figure out where they're end where how they're going to end up in the array using this hash function over here, h of x. So we've got this initially ha empty hash table of size seven. Ta -da. The following sequence of keys is to be inserted. So we've got our keys. Insert each using the following approaches. So here we're using h of x is equal to x mod seven, linear probing. So the key, so the index we're looking for is Take the original value, modify seven, and then resolve any conflicts using linear probing. In other words, look for the next available space. So we're going to go ahead and write, uh, go ahead and calculate these already. So, um, so seventeen, so fifteen mod seven. Fourteen is divisible by seven. Fifteen would be remainder one. Seventeen, sixteen is two. 17 is 3, 18 mod 7 is 1, 22 mod 7 is 2, sorry, 23 mod 7 is 2, because 21 is divisible, it's 2 more than that, and then 3 and 5, 3 mod 7 and 5 mod 7 are 3 and 5 respectively, because it's bigger. So those are the in indexes we want to put this in. So 15 would like to go into index 1. 17 would like to go into index three. Eight would like to go into this one, but it can't because it's already full. So eight is going to go and use linear probing, look for the next available space. It's going to find it in two. So we put eight into, slot, into index two. Now, 23, unfortunately, is very unhappy about this because 23 wanted to go into index two. 
So 23 grumpily looks at the next available space and finds that too is unavailable. So it goes to the next available space and it sees so over here. So 23 goes over here instead. Uh, three tries to insert into index three, but it cannot. So it goes to the next available space, which is also full. So it goes to the next available space, which is five. And finally, five tries to go into here, but it can't. So it goes to the next available space, which is index six. So our answer is 15, eight, 17, 23, three and five. Okay, the next one using quadratic probing. Okay, what we're gonna do over there, it's the same, it's h of x, but the only difference is quadratic probing. So the first two things, 15 wants to go into index one, 17 wants to go into index three, they resolve the same. Eight also resolves the same. It wants to go into index uh, uh, one, but it cannot. So what does it need to do? Well it looks, quadratic probing says, if I can't have the space, I'm gonna look at the space one squared from what I have. If that doesn't work, two squared. If that doesn't work, three squared, and so on and so forth. So eight looks one squared away and voila. 23 tries to go into index two. It cannot. So, looks one, so it looks one squared away. And it finds that one squared away is also taken. So it's going to look two squared away, not from this space, but from the original space. So it looks here and it's gonna look, so it's gonna look one squared away, two, three, two squared away. One, two, three, so it's going to go, so 23 will go over here. Okay. Three, we try to insert here and index three, but we can't. So it's going to look one squared away. It's going to end up in four. And then five, no problem. It just goes in. Now there were three ones that we did, but we but this last one we didn't go over in class, so I don't see a need to do it over here. But I'll just talk about it. So how, this part same, collisions are resolved using double hashing. In other words, you use so if it doesn't work for the first hash function, try a different hash function. There's a lot of different ways to resolve it. So the graph question so. I've done the graph questions on, on this one. There, uh, these graphs are not the greatest graphs for doing uh, def first search, breath first search, or Dijkstra. So I'll go over that on Wednesday. Instead, I'll go ahead and skip down to this over here. Following exam deal parts of the exam deal with binary trees that are constructed out of nodes with the instance of the following class. So here they're looking at a more realistic kind of idea way that you might use the key. Uh, a tree, but not necessarily as generics. We'll do it with generics and kind of do this realistic way, which is public class node. And then the idea here is that you store a key for the tree. And then you'll also have the object value, value just like you would for a map. In fact, trees are sometimes used for maps if you care about how things are sorted. So into key object data, but we're not so, but we're instead going to go ahead and let me go ahead and appearance enter presentation mode. Okay. Instead, what we're going to do, and I've sent out this code already. Okay. I've sent out this code already and I'll rewrite it over here. But instead, what we're going to do is we're going to translate our, our node into this class, which is that we've got a node that takes it that that's made up of key, that has keys and values. Keys are comparable to other keys. Values are just values. They're whatever object we want. Okay. 
And so you have a key, a value, and a left, right. And we just have an initialize. So the same thing, except instead of a data item, we have a key and a value. That's it. Okay, so what is our first task? We've got two functions I'm going to code. First one, here's a method that uses recursion to search for a, for a key in the binary search tree where the root node is preferred to as the parameter root. If it finds the key, returns a reference to the corresponding data item. If it re doesn't, returns node. So basically the same thing, this is our search item. Given the root of the tree and the thing we're looking for, if the key is the key that we're looking for, we're gonna return the data. That's the only twist there, right? It's like a map. Given a key, give me the value, okay? Make sense? Otherwise, if it's left, search the left subtree. Otherwise, search the right subtree. In the space below, write, rewrite search so it doesn't use recursion. Well, I'm not going to do it in the space below because my handwriting is messy, as we've already seen. I'm going to do it on my ID. So let's go ahead and do this. Um, that is for that. And then where's the class ender? There it is. So public static. Um, we're going to return a, val a value v. And the generics are going to be, this is, this is just so that I don't get warnings and also so that I can use generics. k extends, k extends. comparable K and then V we're also going to use V's as well. It's going to return a V and its name is search, which is going to take in a node of uh, nodes that care about keys and values. It's going to be called, the node is going to be called the root and we are going to be searching for a K uh, key, which we're going to call our target. Said to rewrite it, so I did. All right, so first off, um, let's go ahead and just return null in general, because if we can't find anything, we're going to return null. And because I don't like messing with the root, especially when I'm iterating through stuff, I'm going to say node kv current is equal to. Uh, root. All right, that way we can just make sure we understand that current isn't really the root. It's just going to follow along with it. So while current is not equal to null, and if current happens to be null because root is null or we hit a null point at some point, we're going to return null because we couldn't find anything, which is exactly the behavior we want. Okay, that makes sense. So finally, current is not, so if current is equal to null, what we're gonna do is that we are going to do our standard comparison. Comparison is equal to root dot, sorry, we're gonna do target dot compare to, because the order you do this in does matter um, as far as how you want things to go. Toot, root, root toot dot key, okay, we're going to compare our target to the key in here. Um, if comparison is zero, right, that means that the key, that the target is the key that I'm looking for, which means that I found the node that has the key, which means that I want to return root dot value, because I want to get the value associated with the key, just like as if this was a map. Um, else if, not that we need it to be an if because it's a return statement, but it's better to do it that way. Else if, compar else if comparison is less than, less than zero. So if the target is less than the roots key, then we need to go to the left because it's smaller, so it would be on the left side. So in this case, rather than doing recursion, what we're going to do is current is equal to current dot left. As though this was a length 
as though this was a linked list with, you know, two links. And then otherwise, uh, it's not equal, it's not less, only one possibility, it's gotta be greater. So we go to the right, otherwise current is equal to current dot right. And there we go, that's all we've written. And now it's non-recursive. Like I said, you don't, but why do I care about recursion when we do do trees? Because recursion is an important tool to know and it really helps you understand the structure of the tree if you can do these things recursively and the way these things work. We don't need a stack here, by the way, because sometimes you need a stack when you're going through these things. We don't need a stack here because we're not going to be backing up and making decisions at any point. We're just going to be following a branch down left and right. Now, the next question I love, it's probably going to be our final question of the, of the um, day. It's a great question. So write a Java method, <laughs> Java, Java, Java. Write a Java method called mirror that takes in a reference to a root node of a binary, of a binary tree and creates a new tree with its own nodes. That's the mirror image of the original tree. For example, if root is a reference to the root of the tree on the left, then the return value of mirror root would be the right tree. Hint, this is much easier if you write it using recursion. That is a hint. So notice that the tree one, two, three, four, five, six, seven becomes one, three, two, five, four, seven, six. Just check to make sure that's not an emergency. Not great. Ugh. All right. So um so how do we do this? Well, notice that for one, for node one, three and two get flipped, but two keeps his children. Now his children are also flipped. Four and five becomes five and four, and five's children become seven and six. Right. So in other words, what we want is that we want to flip our children and then our children tells their children to flip themselves. Which actually makes for fairly straightforward. Uh, a fairly straightforward. Um, function. Here, same comparable. Our return value is going to be a node because we want to create new nodes k comma v and we're going to take in a mirror as our name and then root and then there we go okay um return null to quash the error so first thing base case let's figure out our base cases which is what we should always do with recursion if if root equal equals null, then what? Well, if it's null, then uh, then the reflection of that is null. So no need to do anything. If I'm blank, just tell my parent, hey, have a blank. Okay. <clears throat> if I'm if on the other hand, <clears throat> sorry. If on the other hand, I exist, then I need to ha make a node that is a mirror of myself. Mirror root, or let's call it new root. New root is equal to new node. And then that should take in root dot key, root dot value. Gotta love autocomplete. Okay. 
next is so the next thing i have to do is i have to swap my children right but it's not enough i need clones of my children and those children need to swap themselves well what i'm gonna do is i need to return a new root so regardless for a new tree i need to return the root of this new tree or subtree and so what i need to do is I need to tell my tree to, uh, I need to tell my children to flip. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, hey, new root, dot right, sorry, new root dot left is equal to root dot right, specifically, create a mirror of the right side that's going to create a mirror that's going to tell my left side to make create a mirror image of itself that's what this function does create a mirror image of self and then that's on my right side so it should be now on my new left it should be the new roots left same thing for the left side mirror root dot left so now they flip And then I just, that's it, actually, that's it. I just have to return that one. So what this does is that it creates a reflection of the left, of the right side. And then, so it creates a reflection, of, uh, it creates a, oh, let's go walk it through it just to make sure. Okay, annotate. So if I've got five, uh, three, one, two, and now I've got set, it, I've got nine, and I've got 12, 11, and 13. Okay, so my output is going to be, It's going to look like this five. So I call it on, on this node over here. Five is going to basically say, hey, create a new node. Now the left side should be the should be this, but mirrored. So the mirror nine, basically nine says, hey, I need to create nine. And then I need to create a mirror of my left side and create it and sorry, create a mirror on my right side, which is this. 12 says, hey, I'm going to create a mirror of my, a uh, 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 new instance of myself, create a mirror of my right side, make it my left, my left side and make it my right. 13 will go, okay, just myself, I have no children and I return myself as his left child, as his new node's left child. 11 will return, will do the same thing, returning as the and return just itself with no children because it has none. 12 gets 13 at, of the right child as the left child and left child as the right child. 12 does, not 13. So nine finally finishes this line over here. So it can say, hey, that's what I've got. And then it will return nine. What's going to happen is that says, it's gonna do it say its right side is equal to its left side. But this is null, this left side is null. So we get for five, nine, 12, nine, 12, 13, 11. And then when we finally work out the right side, it becomes three, two, one. Again, recursion is just extremely powerful. So now, as far as other practice questions, this is one, uh, 
We're going to go over other practice exams in the next coming days. But this is one I, uh, question from an exam I can't access anymore that I really liked. All right. And it's one that I'll go over tomorrow. So suppose you're given a file that looks like this. Right. And the file's always as follows it is username, username, space, and then some number. Okay. The username is, of course, the username, and the number is the number of seconds that this user uh, that the user had a login to the server for. So Andrew, me, had a session uh, lasting twenty three hundred and forty eight seconds. Alice had a session uh, just shy over two minutes. Then I had a session again of twenty one hundred seconds. Then Alice had a bit of a long session with forty six thousand seconds. Bob then had a session, then Carl, then Andrew, and this just keeps going on and on with an arbitrary number of users. We don't know how many, right? But what is the question? Okay, the question is, given this text file, a text file that has this, calculate the average login time for each user for each user. So I want to know Andrew's log average login time, Alice's average login time, Bob's and Carl's. So this in other words is a map. Their our answer should be a map of string which is the username to double which is their average time. Now to do this, we need two maps actually to help us. The first map, I mean, we could do one and create a list, but why? We can use two maps. The first map should be used to count. And the second, uh, how, how many times I logged in. And then the second one should be uh, the sum of all the time uh, that somebody logged in for. And of course, and so of course, the uh, average time would be the sum divided by the count. So I'll leave that one for you to try to solve over the next couple of days if you want to get ahead, if you want to try solving it yourself, because I think practice makes perfect. But if you don't want to, I'll cover it on Wednesday anyway. All right. Um, any questions before I dismiss class? Um, right. Professor, sorry, I couldn't demo earlier, but is it possible? I will just wait until everyone's done and I'll just probably demo if it's okay with you. Yep, that's fine. All right, if you need a demo, you can stick around. Otherwise, class is dismissed. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a good one.